Heavenly Father, we come before you on this beautiful day, petitioning that you will give us of your spirit as we open your word. Give us guidance, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as we look at the channel of the new birth, as we search that out in your words so that we may have a better understanding of that. Father, I pray that you will touch my lips with a call from off your altar, that I may present your thoughts through my words, my body language, and my tone of voice. I pray that you will send angels that excel in strength to be with those that are watching and listening, that um, these angels may push the devil back, that, that those watching and listening may have an opportunity to hear your voice unadulterated. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've looked at uh, the new birth experience in John chapter 3, specifically through the eyes of uh, Nicodemus. But as I'd mentioned before, the new birth experience, the, the born again, the conversion, um, the dying to self, so on and so forth, is talked about so much in the Bible. So we really couldn't possibly do it justice by looking at it just once. So we're going to look at it again from yet another perspective. And so I want to look and focus primarily on the channel of the new birth or the agency of the new birth experience, what that looks like, why the devil is attacking that, and um, then look briefly at results of true conversion, some results of true conversion. So before we really dive into that, though, I, I want to touch on the necessity of conversion again. Uh, if you didn't watch John 3, then I, I would recommend you go back and watch that. But just in case, you know, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, Jesus tells us, except he be converted, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then in John 3, 3, he says, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. These are parallel statements that converted and born again are both the same thing. And what I want you to notice is Jesus is really trying to stress the importance of conversion. Brothers and sisters, if you are not converted, you will not be in heaven. It's just the bottom line. That's what Jesus is saying. And he says it multiple times. And you find it multiple times throughout the word as well. But how often do we preach on it? Mm, not very often. We tend to um, like to preach on, you know, as I mentioned before, more uh, controversial topics. Things that will, that will gain more views or more likes or more people in the congregation or, uh, you know, different things like that. But we, we don't tend to talk about this a whole lot. And maybe, maybe it's because you know it, but you know what? Uh, repetition deepens impression. And I think it's a good idea to go over some of these basics again on a fairly regular basis. Just like, you know, it's not good enough to ponder the, uh, the life of Christ, especially the remaining hour of Christ once. We're to do it on a daily basis. And so also with conversion, this isn't just a once in a lifetime thing. This is a daily experience. So therefore, it behooves us to really dive into this and dig into this because of its importance and because of the impression, the, the uh, not impression, but the, the continuous uh, pushing um, or, or mention, I should say, of it in the Word of God. It's constantly being brought up. I'll say it that way. So, except a man be born again, you cannot enter or see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. But we go down into verse 5 of John chapter 3, and, and we see here, um, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. So, we looked, just two verses, I think that's all we really needed, looking at the necessity of conversion. But now we're going into the agency of this new birth experience, or the conversion. What is the agency? What is the channel of the new birth. And here we're told, uh, Jesus says in verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. And then in verse 8, he says, born of the Spirit. So we've got parallels between uh, verse 3 and verse 8 of John chapter 3, born again and born of the Spirit. So Jesus is very, very clearly telling us that to be born again is the same as born of the Spirit. To be born of the Spirit. And this, this reminds me, we're going we're gonna to look at two things. We're going to look at Spirit 
and then we're going to tie this to creation, and then we're going to tie this to the new birth experience. So spirit, creation, new birth experience. So we looked at just a couple of verses there, tying it to the spirit, and, and we could look at a whole lot more, but I think this, this uh, is enough to, to prove the point. Um, so now let's look at a couple of verses about creation, or I should I say recreation. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, here we're told uh, by Paul under inspiration, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So Paul is saying that it's not the outward works, if you will, that is what gets us to heaven. It's the um, new creature or the new creation. It's that change from the inside out, in other words. It's that heart change, not just a head knowledge of theology, but a heart change, a change from within that matters. And then, of course, that change from within produces uh, the changes from without. But it's not the changes from without that get you to heaven. It's that change from within that gets you to heaven. You may say tomato, tomato, but there's a big difference, brothers and sisters. It is the one causing the other. Um, and actually, there is there is some some reverse effect there, and maybe we'll we'll touch on that at a, at a later point. But um, what we need to remember is the focus needs to be on primary focus needs to be on the inward, the inside, what's going on in the heart, that new creation. And then Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen, Paul tells us something very very similar. Oh, actually, almost identical. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Again, un under inspiration, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So here again, he uses that phrase, a new creature. What is a creature? Something that is created. This is why Christ, for example, is not a creature because he was not created. I and you and I, we are creatures because we are created. So here we are to become a new creature. Old things are to pass away. All things are to become new. This is another way of saying the exact same thing. It, it, as, as, as in John chapter 3 or Matthew 18, 3. We must be converted. These old things must pass away. New things must come forth. There must be a change of the heart. The old man must die. We must cruci be crucified. Um, so on and so forth. There's, there's all these terms that are used to say the exact same thing. But here he uses the term new creation. Or, or um, a new creature. But a creature is something that is created. So we are to become a new creature creation. So we've got spirit and we've got new creation, which brings to mind the question, what was it that created the first time? Because if we can understand what, what, what it was that created the first time, it's going to help us understand what it is that recreates us. Because it's not something different. That which created is that which recreates. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, we see uh, what the Word of God tells us about the new creation or the original creation. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here it was the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the waters. Are you seeing a, a connection? The, the new birth is born of the Spirit. And we are to become a new creation. How? By the Spirit. What was it that created initially? It was the moving of the, uh, the Spirit upon the waters. Let's compare that to Psalms 33 and verse 6. Psalms 33 and verse 6. This may be familiar to you, but or, uh, you, you, may, you may be very well familiar with this verse, but it ties in beautifully here. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath 
of his mouth. So what was it that created everything? Was it God the Holy Spirit? No. It was the word of the Lord. God said, and bang, it happened. Yes, I do believe in the Big Bang. It's not a theory, it's a fact. God said it, bang, it happened. And so God said, God spoke, and this was creation, the speaking of God. The word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord's were the heavens made. And brothers and sisters, by the word of the Lord are we, were we created and we are recreated by the same thing. This is why it is important to understand the creation account and how things were created because, brothers and sisters, it is by that same account that we are recreated. And if we believe it was God the Holy Spirit that created, then we must look to God the Holy Spirit to recreate. But if we understand, as the Bible tells us, you never find anywhere, by the way, God the Holy Spirit creating anything, because there is no God the Holy Spirit, but you do find that by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So therefore, by the word of the Lord were we made, and by the word of the Lord are we remade. We were created by that word, and we are recreated by that word. How do we become a new creature? 1 Peter 1.23. Peter here really simplifies it and nails it down very, very clear. 1 Peter chapter um, 1 and verse 23. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So what is the, how, how are we born again? We are born again by the word of God. You see, brothers and sisters, it all ties together. It is, um, we are born again by the Spirit, and we become a new creature or a new creation. It was by that Spirit that the world was created, and so it is by that Spirit, that Word, that we are recreated. How do we become a new creature? By the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, this is also why it is important to understand that who created us? Who created us? Because it is that individual that has recreative power. Is it, was it God the Holy Spirit that created us? Because if so, then we need to kneel at the foot of God the Holy Spirit and ask for that recreation. But we know that it's not. Was it the Father that created us? He created all things through Christ. It was Christ that actually created us. See, if Christ doesn't have creative power, then brothers and sisters, he doesn't have re-creative power. That's a big deal. That's a big, big deal. That's a big issue. Many people may not understand why we make such a big issue of that. And I hope that becomes clear that if Christ does not have creative power, then he does not have re-creative power. And it becomes the same as a God the Holy Spirit concept. We're taking away from Christ that which is Christ's. So we must be born again. We must be converted. Otherwise, we will not see the kingdom of God. And we see that that born again is being born of the Spirit. And that Spirit recreates us into a new creature or a new creation. And it was that spirit or that word of God that created everything to begin with. And so therefore, it is that word of God that recreates in us a clean heart. It is that word that uh, makes us to be born again. As Peter says in, in tw uh, chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
So let's look now. So we've looked at the necessity of conversion uh, very briefly, just two verses. We looked pretty briefly at the channel of the new birth. And so I want to look at results of true conversion. And if you want to look these verses up, I, I encourage you to look these verses up. I'm not going to go from verse to verse on this because I want to, uh, I want the flow to emphasize the points as opposed to having to stop and, and, and look at these verses and, and then reading all the context. I encourage you to go back and read all the context, but I'm going to hit the main points in these verses as we go along. So I want to look at results of true conversion. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, uh, those that are converted are quickened. And quickened, being quickened is uh, life-giving. The quickening spirit is the life-giving giving spirit. To be quickened is to be given life. We are quickened. 1 John 3, 14, we love the brethren. We'll come back to that one a little bit later in this series. James chapter 5 and verse 20, uh, one of the results of true conversion is to be saved from death. Be saved from death. Of course, this is saying the exact same thing as Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, where we are quickened. It's just saying it from the opposite perspective. To be quickened is the same as saved from death. Just one is looking at a positive and one is looking at a, a little, uh, the negative aspect. Although saved from death is still a positive thing, but the death is the negative thing. There's what I'm getting at. Luke 22, 31 and 32, to strengthen thy brethren is one of the results of conversion. Again, we're going to see this theme come up several times. And again, we will come back to that a little later in this the series. But I do want to mention them here because they are a result of true conversion. Also, we see in Matthew 13, 15, that we have healing. Now that healing, uh, I want to I kind of touch on this for just a moment because I want to be sure that I make myself clear as to what this healing is or that, let me rephrase that, um, because it, it, it really doesn't matter what I say it is. Um, so it doesn't matter how clear I make myself. What, what I want to do is I want to make sure that it is understood clearly what the Word of God is saying on that healing and that we don't misunderstand it because a misunderstanding of this from personal experience can lead to frustration and even uh, close to giving up um, salvation. So healing here is not so much physical healing, although I believe that that can kind of come along with it, but that's not the point that is trying to be made. Uh, Jesus isn't talking about uh, healing in the sense of physical healing there, primarily speaking. Hosea 14, 4, I think, uh, gives a, a little better understanding of that by telling us that uh, our backsliding is healed. And how am I healed? Isaiah 53. I want to read this. Um, Isaiah 53, verse 5. Anytime I can, I, I like to um, read Isaiah 53 any chance I get. And I have a chance to read it here, so I'm going to read it. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. Here we're told, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. So how are we healed? We are healed with his stripes. Um, he received that which we should have received. And we receive that which he should have received received. God is good. So when it talks about healing, I believe that um, that's a healing of our backsliding. I also, though, believe that if from personal experience, I guess I can say, um, upon conversion, there also begins a healing of, of um, mental distress. You could put it that way. Um, many of you, actually, none of us had a perfect parents. None of us had perfect parents. And so we're all dealing with things or dealt with things uh, due to our past. And conversion for me helped me deal with a lot of those things. I've got really good parents actually, but even still they were sinful. I wasn't in a perfect situation. And so I had baggage. And at the time of conversion, I, I really started 
uh, the Lord really started lifting a lot of this off of me. And so I believe personally that a lot of the healing that's being spoken of here is not just uh, backsliding in doctrinal areas or in spiritual areas, uh, healing that, but also uh, beginning the healing process of a mental distress, if you will, along with um, physical to some degree as well, especially once we take on the health message. But I think the primary is dealing with backsliding. Uh, so getting back to the topic, results of true conversion, chap uh, uh, 1 John 2.29 tells us we do righteousness. This is one of the results of true conversion is to do righteousness. Again, 1 John 4.7 we love one another is another one of the true results of conversion is to love one another. And again, we'll come back to that. Why? Because we need to spend a whole session just on that one alone. And what does that look like? What does that mean? That one is very misunderstood, just like conversion is very misunderstood. So we're going to come back to that and spend a whole um, sermon just on that one alone. And then Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 we receive no more condemnation. This is a result of true conversion, is, is no longer receiving condemnation. Praise God. So, what are, what are these results again? We are quickened, we love the brethren, we're saved from death, we're, we strengthen the brethren, we have healing, which is primarily a healing of our backsliding, we do righteousness, we love one another, and we no longer have condemnation, which maybe for some of you, that is the harder one to deal with, is to let go of that self-condemnation. And the reason I say self-condemnation is because if you have asked forgiveness for these things, brothers and sisters, then you have been forgiven. There is no more condemnation to you from God. So if you are receiving condemnation, it is from yourself and or from others. Those others are not judging you, so don't worry too much about that. Worry about what God thinks, um, because that is what matters the most. Not that other people don't matter, because other people do matter, but God is what matters the most. And so you need to worry about his condemnation. If you're not receiving condemnation from him because you have uh, repented of these things, then brothers and sisters, let it go. Let it go. Don't worry. Quit Quit worrying about it. Quit bringing it back to him. He has forgiven us. So we don't need to keep beating ourselves over the head with it. Give it to him because there is no more condemnation. I want everyone to experience these things. Brothers and sisters, I want everyone to heal, to, to, to feel that quickening, a life-giving experience of the Holy Spirit. I want each one of us to have a love of the brethren. I want each one of us to be saved from death. <laughs> you know, it is, it is, there's so much peace in knowing that you are saved from death. I want each one of us to be able to strengthen the brethren. I want each one of us to, to, to experience that healing. Not only the healing of, of our backsliding, our theological wrongs, our spiritual wrongs, but also a mental healing, even a physical healing it's at times. I want each one of us to experience that. I want each one of us, brothers and sisters, to be doing righteousness. I want each one of us to be loving one another. And I also want each one of us to recognize that at conversion, we have no more condemnation. We have no more condemnation. Stop bringing these past sins to God. If you have repented of them, stop bringing them to him. Stop reminding him of them because he's trying to put them away. You keep bringing them back to him. Stop bringing them back to him. Accept that forgiveness. It may be hard. Actually, I don't know of anybody that it was easy for, although I suppose maybe there are some. I, I know it was hard for me to accept forgiveness. But as I read the Word of God more and more, I realized, no, 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 this is right. This is true. And so I was able to accept that forgiveness. I, I was able to lay aside that condemnation, stop condemning 
myself? How do I gain this experience? Let's go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, we are told um, how we can gain the new birth experience. 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Brothers and sisters, this is very much like uh, what we looked at last time in, in John chapter 3. The core of the how or the why, I should say, we give our uh, life to Christ. Why we are born again is recognizing the cross. And, and we're not going to recognize the sacrifice at that cross if we do not understand Jesus to be the actual Son of God. And that's exactly what John is telling us here again. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That is what we're looking at, being born again. And how are we born again? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born again. And everyone that loveth him that begat, who begat? That's the Father. Loveth him also that is begotten of him. Who is it? Who's begotten? Jesus is the one that's begotten. And who is him? The Father. So I want to read that again. Everyone that loveth him, uh, the Father loveth him also that is begotten of the Father, which is Jesus Christ. So there again, Jesus being the actual, literal, begotten Son of God is at the very core, at the very center of that new birth experience. The more we study that, the more we understand the sacrifice, the true sacrifice that was made for us on that cross because Jesus is the Son of God. That's why these things can happen or could have happened. The more we study that, the more our hearts are broken, and the more we recognize God's love for us. So therefore, we have that love response going back. So how do I gain this experience? Uh, let's look now at 2 Corinthians 3.18 is another way of gaining that experience. Or, or really, it's not another way. It's an, another way of saying how we gain that experience. Not another way of gaining it but another way of saying it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. I keep skipping right over it here. And here Paul tells us under inspiration, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So here we see that channel or that agency of the new birth experience by the Spirit of the Lord. But we see that the way this happens is by beholding or looking, in other words. As we look at the world, we will become like the world. But if we want to become like Christ, it, brother, I hope that by now you recognize the necessity of being uh, becoming like Christ, that born again experience. If we want that born again experience, and it needs to be daily, not just once, but daily, that born again experience, then in order to have that, we need to behold. We need to behold Christ. If we're going to be like Christ, we need to behold him. We will be like that which we behold. That is a concept that is given to us in the Bible. It is a concept that is given to us in nature. We will be like that which we behold. So what are you beholding? Are you beholding Christ as he is found in the word? In nature? Or are you beholding Baal? Are you beholding the ways of the world? Are you beholding your television? Your national geographic or national pornographic? Because it's got major errors in it. Um, I won't go into that. That's besides the point. What are you beholding? Are you beholding wrong music? 
Are you beholding the junk that is around you? Or are you beholding Christ? Because that which you behold is what you're going to become like. If you find yourself struggling with sin, you're struggling with something, brothers and sisters, you cannot behold the world and give up sin. It's not going to happen. We must behold Christ. We were slaves to sin. Jesus came down and suffered with us and for us and delivered us. As we behold him in his word and in prayer and meditation and serve him in the person of others, we may be changed more and more into the glory of his likeness. Then, if faithful, we shall someday see him face to face. My challenge to you, again, is to be born again. But I want to be more specific this time. My challenge to you is to spend more time beholding Christ. I don't know how much time you spend each day. It's going to vary, obviously, from person to person. But the more time you spend, the more overcoming ability you will have. And brothers and sisters, we're, we're not going to be born again daily without that experience of beholding Christ without that experience of believing that Jesus is the Son of God, seeing it from the Word, believing it in our heart, and, and experiencing that love that comes from the Father and the Son. So if you are willing to take whatever, however much time you've got that you're, you're spending, if, you want, if you're willing to take and spend a little more time, or maybe a lot more time, but just spend some more time beholding Christ, I would ask that you would raise your hand because I can't, I can't see you. And maybe you're alone. It does, so maybe no one else can see you. But you know what? The angels see you. And they are recording this decision. And so I want you to make a public um, commitment here and now. Not, not to me. But to Jesus. That you will spend more time beholding him. So that we may overcome the world. Where possible, let's kneel in closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sure word that you've given to us. Father, I thank you that the agency or the, the channel of that new birth experience has been made clear in your word. And that channel is the spirit or, or the word, your word, the spoken word. Father, there is power in your spoken word. And we want that spoken word in our hearts. And so just as Jesus created all things, so Father, I want him to recreate me. And for those watching and listening that have committed their lives to you, Father, they also want Jesus to recreate them. Father, the devil doesn't want that. He would rather us to think we're converted when we're not. He would rather us act like a Christian to some degree, but live like the devil the rest of the time. He would rather us give glory to this mysterious God, the Holy Spirit, as instead of recognizing your son being your son instead of recognizing the sacrifice that was made on the cross. And so, Father, we thank you for revealing the channel very clearly in your word. And, Father, as we look at the results of conversion, I want those results. And those watching, I'm sure, want those results as well in our lives. And so, Father, we come to you humbly before your throne of grace, asking that you will send Jesus as the refreshing rain into our hearts to recreate us, to renew us, to give it, to make us, turn us into that new creature. And so, Father, we thank you for answering this prayer because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.